and tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Thanks for showing up to work, friend. It's National Lead the Office Early Day, and here we are, just getting started. No, far be it from me to complain, Chester. I mean, it's hardly do rigueur to drink on the job these days. Can you imagine? Well, never mind. When it costs a day blood, the bar is always open. So come on in, friend. No cover charge. Hmm. That's better. So let's smoke them if you got them, friends, and drink those glasses to the bottom. Cause old Drew blood don't cotton to no corporate policies. Except for the rigmarole, that is. Oh, hey. I didn't see you there. You know, Drew Blood's Dark Tales is only one of the many shows on this network you could be listening to. We hope you'll subscribe to our entire lineup, including... Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, Scary Stories Told in the Dark, Fear from the Heartland, and Horror Hill. All available on YouTube or your favorite podcast platform. Also, visit simplyscarypodcast.com to become a patron. For as little as $5 a month, you get our entire catalog ad-free and available to download or stream. A bargain. And now, back to the show. Yeah, the rigmarole thing is kind of important. Anyway, tonight's story is the tale of a troubled child forced to care for his abusive mother. It's likely to get your hackles up, but from where I come from, they call that honest writing. So, without further delay, from author Brian Asbury, Son of a Bitch. Tammy Lynn Parker? The clerk called out from behind the counter at the social services office. The woman in the waiting room was large, broad in the britches, and had to use momentum and brute force to lift herself up from the chair. She collected her two children and lumbered slowly toward the clerk. When she got to the counter, she leaned over and rested like she had just run a 5K. Ma'am, are you okay? I'm fine. It's just always so hot in here, Tammy barked. How can I help you today? My son's disability benefits were lowered again. This is the second time this has happened. She looked over at her daughter, Divinity, who was wandering off. Girl, you better get your scrawny ass back over here. She turned back to the clerk. So anyway, my son has severe autism and we depend on that money each month. I see. I'm sorry to hear that. If I could just get a little more information from you, I can try and figure out what happened. Is Tammy Lynn one word, or is that a middle name? It's one word with an I, not a Y. They misspelled it before down here. The clerk typed at her computer, gathering information in what seemed like a tense standoff between the two. So it looks like your benefits were recalculated this cycle. And due to the fact that you also collect benefits on your other child, the state lowered the amount. Tammy's nostrils flared like a bull who was about to charge a matador as she stood there fuming. Okay, I'd like an appeal form then. No problem, just give me one sec and I can print one out for you. Taking food right out of a disabled child's mouth. Tammy mumbled under her breath. The clerk smiled nervously as she clicked her mouse. Here you go, Miss Parker. Tammy snatched the forms out of her hand. You ain't heard the last of me. Divinity grabbed the door. A cigarette hung out of her mouth as she seemed to take her anger out on her young son Tyrell. She threw him in his car seat and tightened the straps down as he cried and kicked his feet in protest. When they got home, Dice, their pit bull, ran out of the house to greet the kids. He began barking and jumping around in circles. Andre! Andre! 
control your dog, she shouted. Her boyfriend Andre burst out of the house carrying a tan leather leash. He whipped the ground next to Dice, which caused him to cower and whimper. I hate that fucking dog, Tammy said callously. Divinity went to her room and put in her earbuds, longing to escape the living hell that her mother was putting her through. Tyrell was five and had spent the better part of his life seeing specialists and in and out of hospitals. He was autistic and nonverbal, the kind that steals that indescribable connection between a parent and child. But that connection was never there. He was a mere bargaining chip to Tammy. All through her pregnancy, she never bothered abstaining from drugs and alcohol. Nor did she ever prepare nutritious meals to meet the needs of a growing fetus. He was born with THC in his system, and through some perverse miracle, Tammy managed to talk her way out of having him taken by Child Protective Services. Andre was a former drug dealer and DJ at Pinky Showgirls, who was now working at the steel mill. It wasn't the exciting or fast-paced line of work that he was used to, but it was steady income and a place where a man could make an honest wage. He had his share of demons, but he tried to be the father that he never had. Tyrell could hear Tammy coming for him as he sobbed uncontrollably. She stomped through the house like Godzilla smashing through Tokyo. He pulled the sheets over his head, hoping they would somehow act as a force field, but they never did. She threw off his blanket and ripped him from his bed. Andre burst into Tyrell's room after he heard his screams and saw Tammy abusing him. What the fuck are you doing? Stop it! He shouted, pushing her away. He sniffed Tyrell's behind and frowned. He needs a damn diaper change! Then change it! She said as she retreated into the kitchen. Andre looked at the red marks on Tyrell's body. If you keep putting bruises on him like this, we're going to wind up in some serious shit. A happy birthday banner hung from their rickety fence in the backyard. Divinity was turning 10. Their home was filled with people, but despite being surrounded by friends and family, she felt a constant sense of isolation. Persistent depressive disorder, as her pediatrician had labeled it. In the kitchen was fried chicken, cornbread, and other traditional southern side dishes. Catherine, Tammy's mother, helped her prepare the food while the guests waited outside on the patio. Tammy picked at the chips and dip, then took a bite of a drumstick, sucking the meat and cartilage off the bone like a vacuum cleaner. Her mother, who was a large woman herself, stopped cutting potatoes and sat her knife down. Tammy, I love you, but your eating is getting out of control, she said with a look of concern. Tammy sighed. I'm almost 30 years old. I've been eating this way since I was a kid, and I ain't got no plans of stopping now. I know. It's just your weight. What about my weight, huh, Mom? Her mother's eyes teared up, and she reached to snatch the drumstick out of Tammy's hand. Tammy's eyes got big like a dog who was about to attack. The two struggled for a minute, and Tammy pinned her against the refrigerator. As Tammy lunged forward, her mother grabbed her wrist. Tammy drove the drumstick toward her mother's throat like a weapon. It inched dangerously close, nearly grazing her skin before finally slipping out of her hand and flying onto the kitchen floor. Her mother managed to break free and ran out of the kitchen crying. Tammy walked out onto the patio carrying a platter of potato chips, bacon and cheese dip that was spilling over the sides and jalapeno poppers. Divinity looked at the snacks. Is there any veggies? None of us eat that shit. You can take the bread and not the jalapeno poppers and eat that. Tammy's father walked up to her. What the hell happened with you and your mom? I'm tired of pretending that all of a sudden she gives a shit about me. That's what happened. Her mother stormed out of the party. Catherine! Her father yelled, but she was already gone. <sighs> listen. Just listen. Her father pleaded. I know you two hadn't seen eye to eye, but give her a break, okay? I think she's going through, you know, menopause. He said it like it was a dirty word. Tammy looked at him with her mouth open. That's a little TMI, Dad, okay? God, I had plenty of complications, not to mention that I gained almost 50 pounds when I was pregnant with Tyrell, and you never heard me bitching. Shit, 
Andre said as he looked over at her, rolling his eyes. You shut up. You have no idea what those little monsters do to a woman's body. Little Debbie did that to your body, not Tyrell. A fire seemed to ignite behind Tammy's eyes. Motherfucker, don't forget who's cooking this food you're about to eat. Go ahead and keep talking shit. She replied, spraying saliva from her mouth as she spoke. Uh, I'm gonna go, her father said. He would often get nervous and uncomfortable when Tammy would have her outbursts. I can't think when you start yelling like that. After they finished eating, Tammy's area of the table looked like a battlefield. Chicken, pork, spare ribs, and various other deep-fried remains laid piled up on her plate like casualties. She cleaned up and then placed the last of Divinity's presents in the living room. After everyone shuffled into the house, she called out to her. Okay, where's my birthday girl? Divinity came inside the house with her arms crossed. Tyrell reached for the gifts as Tammy swatted his hands. This is your sister's birthday, not yours. His face then grimaced and he quickly burst into tears. She motioned to Andre with her head. He grabbed Tyrell's hand and walked him to his room. He swung the door open and pushed him inside, then closed it as he walked away. Tyrell just laid on his bed, sniffling and despondent. Tammy pointed at a small package that was adorned with a flowing ribbon. Now you have to save that one for last, she told Divinity. Pink and gold wrapping paper soon littered the floor as Divinity feverishly tore open her gifts. And as children sometimes do, she forgot her mother's words and tore open the present that she was supposed to save for the end. It was a beautiful gold necklace that she began placing around her neck. Tammy exploded. You little bitch! What did I just tell you? Divinity paused and the smile left her face. What the fuck did I just tell you? She put her head down. To save this one for last? She whispered sheepishly. Then why the fuck did you just open it? She nervously shrugged her shoulders and the guests all looked around at each other awkwardly. It was part of a set, and that was supposed to be your surprise, but you just ruined that. Go easy on it, Tammy. You know how little kids get around presents, Andre's uncle Todd said. Tammy jerked her head to the side and glared at him. I don't need anyone telling me how to speak to my child. Todd crossed his arms and leaned back with a miffed look on his face. Tammy's friend Jessica helped her pick up after everyone began leaving. I know it can be stressful trying to make everything perfect for your kids. Birthdays and holidays only make it worse sometimes. Tammy leaned on the edge of the sofa and let out a heavy sigh. I'm stern with my kids because I love them. It's easy for Andre's family to sit there and criticize me, but they have no idea what it's like raising a disabled child. When Andre was locked up, I was the only one those kids had in their life, but they all forget that shit. Jessica nodded. I know what you mean. It seems like so many people are afraid to discipline their kids nowadays. If I so much as swat my daughter on the butt, Austin's mom gets all defensive. Like, I was spanked as a kid, and I turned out all right. Tammy sat in the drive-thru at Pizza King. It was her turn in line and her eyes got big as the window opened and she was handed a large pizza and a two liter of coke. She turned onto the highway and opened the lid as the steam escaped, filling the inside of her vehicle with the robust smell of toppings. All meat and no veggies as usual. Tyrell cried out for a slice. She placed one on a napkin and handed it to Divinity. Share that with your brother and make sure he doesn't choke on it. The rest of the pie sat vulnerable on the seat next to her. Hungry Like the Wolf by Duran Duran blared from her speakers as she took a bite. Mm, son of a bitch! She exclaimed as a rogue pepperoni swan dived off the cheese and landed in her cleavage. Her vehicle swerved erratically as she dug around in her bra. She pulled into the parking lot of the kindergarten that Tyrell would be attending. It was Catholic-based, and as Tyrell walked up the sidewalk, he looked up at the patron saints in visions of heaven that were painstakingly etched into the stained-glass windows. 
When they got inside, the classroom smelled like paste and chalkboard erasers. Children zoomed around the room chaotically. The teacher, Mrs. Stratman, was a frail gray-haired lady who extended her hand toward Tyrell. Hello, Tyrell. My name is Mrs. Stratman, she said with a welcoming smile. Tyrell looked up at her skittishly, then slowly raised his arm to shake her hand. So you guys are feeding him, right? Tammy asked the teacher. She nodded warmly. Of course. Children always seem to learn better with a full belly. Tammy turned to Tyrell and ruffled his hair. Be good. I'll be back to pick you up in a bit. As she went to leave, Tyrell stood next to the teacher. Mrs. Stratman got a surprised look on her face. Well, that's a first. Most kids won't leave their parents on their first day here. Tammy stopped and turned around, then smirked. He's autistic, so he has trouble expressing his emotions sometimes. Mrs. Stratman walked Tyrell around the classroom, showing him the different learning stations. Soon afterwards, a little girl walked up to him and introduced herself. Hi, my name's Emma. What's yours? She asked. Tyrell just stood there, not exactly sure what to do. He looked around the room, overcome by all the distractions and unable to focus on one thing. This was the first time in his life that he had been exposed to that many other children, and it proved to be overwhelming. He soon began to cry. Mrs. Stratman came running over to him and hugged him securely. I know. It's a lot to take in at first, but you'll be fine. Hey, how about we go over to the art card and draw some pictures, she said spiritedly. As she held Tyrell's hand, she could feel him begin pulling away. Uh, What's wrong, Tyrell? You don't like it when I hold your hand? Tyrell's mind had made a negative connection with holding an adult's hand. It usually meant he was being led to his room to get beaten or locked away, a punishment he often endured to pay for the crime of merely being born, it seemed. When he got to the art cart, he sat down at the desk. Mrs. Stratman showed him some of the pictures that the other children had drawn. Megan had colored a unicorn, and Efren drew Spider-Man flying through the air. Now you can draw or color whatever your heart desires, she said, handing him some art supplies. Tyrell grabbed some crayons and soon began coloring. Late that afternoon, when the parents began filing in to pick up their children, Mrs. Stratman waited near the entrance to the school with Tyrell. Tammy slowly made her way inside. Well, how'd everything go? She asked, looking at the teacher. Mrs. Stratman smiled somewhat uncomfortably. Well, Mrs. Parker, I'd like to show you something. Today, during coloring time, Tyrell drew this. Mrs. Stratman held up a sheet of construction paper. On the paper was a crude drawing of a creature that looked like an evil version of Sonic the Hedgehog. It had red eyes and giant claws protruding from its hands and feet, scattered around the creature were what looked like the bodies of a family, Tyrell's family. The bodies were badly mangled and mutilated. Tammy was portrayed as a giant blob that was lying in a pool of maroon-colored blood. She was missing her head, and one of her arms was lying a few inches away from her body. Andre was standing upright but had no eyes, just two empty sockets with blood hemorrhaging from them. Tammy exploded. What is that? She said, looking down at Tyrell. Is that supposed to be us? Mrs. Stratman raised her hands defensively. Ms. Parker, please. I didn't show you this to anger you. Tammy sighed. Well, what did you expect? I mean, I don't look like no peach-colored blob. Okay, ma'am. I need you to just calm down for a minute. Tammy took a deep breath. Okay, I'm calm. How is you and your son's relationship? We honestly don't have much of one. If he's hungry, he cries. If he's sleepy, he cries. Most of the interactions we have revolve around me just trying to figure out how to get him to stop fussing. 
Mrs. Stratman paused thoughtfully. I've been teaching children for over 40 years now, and on top of that, I'm also a mother. I know the difficulties of raising a child with special needs. My son Daniel was born with cerebral palsy. She sighed. It was challenging, to say the least, but it was a worthwhile challenge and a labor of love. Now, sometimes kids have quite an imagination, but I know that if it was me, I'd want to know if my child drew something like that. Tammy stood with her hands on her waist. Do children usually draw pictures like this? I've seen children draw all sorts of interesting things. But to answer your question, no, not typically. Tammy strapped Tyrell in his car seat, then slammed her door as she got in. She turned around and pointed at him. Don't you think for a fucking minute that a few words from your teacher just suddenly smoothed everything over? She hissed. I can't believe you embarrassed me like that. Tears began trickling down Tyrell's face. And if you try any of that weird shit, you're gonna be sorry. That evening, after Andre left for work, Tammy laid sprawled out on the recliner. She fixed her hair and makeup and was dressed in a revealing lace nightgown. She took a drag on her blunt, then checked her live stream to make sure it was on. Hi, Rampage. How you doing tonight, baby? She said into the microphone of her Xbox headset. You ready for some action? Tammy bounced up and down as she mashed the buttons on her controller. Look to your left! Look to your left! She hollered. Pretty soon, Tyrell came wandering into the room. She seen him and quickly covered herself. What do you think you're doing? What did I tell you about coming in here while I'm working? He rubbed his stomach to indicate that he was hungry. She looked at her phone and saw that it was two hours past his dinner time. Shit. Okay, come on, she said to him. Be back in a minute, baby. She whispered into her microphone in a sultry voice. She went into the kitchen and opened the cabinet, grabbing a can of raviolis. She went to open it when she saw an envelope sitting next to the can opener. It was addressed to a Ms. Tammy Lynn Parker. In the top left-hand corner was the Make-A-Wish Foundation's logo. Tammy's face lit up as she tore it open. The letter inside read, Dear Tammy, we here at the Make-A-Wish Foundation of Colorado are pleased to inform you that your son Tyrell has been approved to receive a wish. In the next few weeks, Make-A-Wish volunteers will be contacting you for an interview, so please have Tyrell begin to think about what his magical wish will be. Tammy sat the letter down and picked up Tyrell. You did it, boy! We're going to Disneyland! This wasn't Tyrell's wish, it was hers. Tammy had dreamed about going to Disneyland since she was a little girl, and Tyrell's condition was her ticket there. She grabbed her phone to call Andre and tell him the news. Tyrell just stared glumly at his dinner that sat unopened next to the can opener. A little over a month after receiving the acceptance letter, Tammy drove the family to the airport to catch their flight to California. She wore her sunglasses and bobbed her head cheerfully to the music while smoking a joint. At least roll the window down, damn, Andre said, waving away the smoke. Divinity pulled her shirt over her nose. Tammy kept looking forward. I'm not going to let you, or anyone for that matter, ruin my trip. Once at the airport, she handed the passenger service agent her phone. He scanned her boarding pass, then studied his monitor. Hmm, well, we may have an issue here. Looks like you have four tickets, but if you require an extra seat, you'll need to purchase an additional one. The problem is, we don't have any more available on this flight. She huffed and looked over at Andre. We do have another flight that departs at 4.30 if you'd like me to check on that one. Tammy slammed her hand down on the counter. I'll fit in the seat, she said with her eyes bulging out of her head. She boarded their flight, then turned sideways and sucked in her stomach as she slowly inched her way down the aisle. 
Sitting next to her was a slender man that was typing on his laptop. He braced himself for her descent into the seat. She tried to make her body as small as possible by shifting all her weight to the half of her seat that faced the aisle. The other half of her body, though, still managed to encroach uncomfortably on the man for the next thousand miles. Afterwards, she limped off the flight. You okay? Andre asked. Hell no. I was in excruciating pain the whole flight, she said as she lugged her suitcase down the jetway. When they exited the airport, they were greeted by sunshine, palm trees, and a stretch limo that's body line seemed to run the entire length of the parking lot. Tyrell smiled in amazement. During their ride, Andre opened the sunroof, and Tyrell and Divinity took turns standing up through the opening. Tyrell closed his eyes as the wind blew wildly through his hair, and for that moment in time he felt as though he was free. They were dropped off at Spippy's car rental. The associate at the service desk looked up from his computer after entering some information. Well, folks, you ready to pick out your car? They walked through the parking lot until they entered a covered garage. Okay, you can pick any one of these fine vehicles. The carefree smile drained from Tammy's face as she took off her sunglasses. You're kidding, right? She said as she looked at a row of compact cars. Just chill, relax, Andre said, trying to defuse the situation. There were two of us, plus our kids. Isn't there anything larger? Sure, you can upgrade, but we only have our premium line of vehicles left, and they're considerably more expensive. The two just looked at each other. Their small Toyota car leaned visibly to Tammy's side as she drove them to their hotel. Droplets of sweat formed on her forehead from the blistering afternoon heat. This fucking AC ain't worth a shit, she said, slamming her fist on the dash. When they got to their hotel room, Tammy let out a giant sigh of relief, then rubbed her swollen legs. I'm taking a much-needed shower. They were on the fifth floor, which provided Andre with the perfect vantage point to snap some photos of the California skyline. Damn, it looks just like the movies out here. Yeah, except in the movies there ain't all the homeless people, Divinity said as she looked down at the row of tents that lined the sidewalk. The next day, traffic thickened the closer they got to Disneyland. Tammy slowed down to get a better view of the outside of the park. She was immediately met by motorists that began honking their horns and aggressively tailgating her. She blasted her horn and threw her arms in the air. Go around me, you dumb motherfucker! Andre clutched his seatbelt with a death grip and tapped his foot nervously. Tammy got a nostalgic feeling as she walked through the entrance to the park. Many of the characters that she remembered fondly from her childhood walked around interacting with spectators. One of the seven dwarves came up to Tyrell and bent down. Well, hey, little buddy! He said rambunctiously. Tyrell got a frightened look on his face and began crying. They stood in line for the kamikaze ride. When Tammy got to the gate, an attendant put his wand up to stop her. I'm sorry, ma'am, but we have a size limit. We need to be able to lock the crossbar in place over your body. Lord knows I ain't taking any more chances ever since we stuffed that one kid into the teacup ride, and then he ended up falling out and getting pinned underneath the gingerbread house. You mean to tell me I waited in line over 40 minutes just to get turned away? Tammy huffed and stormed off, pushing her way through the crowd. She walked over to the funnel cake stand and pulled out a 20. <sighs> Give me one with extra powdered sugar. She sat down on a bench, eating her funnel cake and scowling enviously at the rides. As the sun began to dip below the clouds and dusk faded from the sky, Tammy sat next to Divinity with her arms crossed, riding the Ferris wheel. And to think I waited 28 years for this shit, she said dejectedly. How can you be so unhappy in the happiest place on earth? Andre asked. Well, I thought it was pretty dope. What about you, little man? What'd you think? He said, pulling Tyrell's baseball cap down over his eyes. Tyrell just let his smile answer for him. As they walked back to their rental car, Tammy stopped and rested against a light pole. 
My hip feels like it's in a vice right now. Give me the keys and I'll pull the car up here, Andre said. She began digging through her purse, but was having trouble finding the keys. Fuck! She exclaimed, throwing her arms down. She rubbed her eyes, fighting back the tears. I can't stand being trapped in this body. Tyrell looked up at her innocently. What are you looking at? She said as she wiped away her tears. A few weeks after returning home from their trip, Andre noticed their Xbox was left on and Tammy's profile was unlocked. He grabbed her controller and began cycling through the game titles. Suddenly, the message alert icon lit up at the top of the screen. He clicked on it, and a long list of messages from different users popped up. He scrolled down to Nasty Hulk and began reading their conversation. Yo, Tammy! Andre exclaimed. Tammy came strolling into the living room. What's this? He said, pointing at the TV screen. Who are these dudes you've been talking to on here? It's nothing. They're just people that watch me on my live stream. Bullshit. I read some of those messages. I just leave them on so I can get viewers. Andre got up and threw down the controller. You might as well be selling your ass on the corner. It's just fantasy. It's not real. Dice began barking. Well, I tell you what is real. When I get up out this bitch, I'm fucking done. What? Tammy replied. Dice continued barking uncontrollably. Shut up! Tammy yelled. Then she kicked Dice's leg, snapping it sideways like a dry twig. He let out a blood-curdling yelp and ran off limping. <sighs> Fucking mutt! I'm done with your psycho ass, and I'm taking my son with me. Tammy grabbed Andre's arm. For the first time in their relationship, he felt the strength that she possessed, and it startled him. He tried pulling away, but he was overpowered and outweighed by almost 200 pounds. Get your big ass off me, he pleaded. Her eyes narrowed the little slits, and she seemed to take pleasure in watching him squirm. Don't you forget you're laid off work, and you ain't got no place to live. If you try taking Tyrell, I'll take your ass to court, just like I did Divinity's dad, and you'll never see your son again. She then released him from her grip. He stumbled backwards and pointed at her as he shook his head. You're just lucky I ain't the person I used to be. He then walked out of the house, slamming the door behind him. Divinity stood behind Tyrell, hugging him tightly as the two watched from the hallway. Nine years had passed, and Tammy's health continued declining as her body mass grew and grew. She was alone, morbidly obese and largely homebound. Divinity and Tyrell had been left to care for her. At the same time, a strange and miraculous thing began to unfold with Tyrell. It happened one day while he was sitting in his class, and it was as unexpected as a snowstorm in June. So to summarize, a lunar eclipse is an event that happens when the moon moves into the Earth's shadow. Does anyone have any questions? The teacher asked. Tyrell slowly raised his hand. The teacher got a surprised look on his face and called on him. Tyrell? He paused for a moment, then began to sound out words. I want to watch the eclipse tonight. The teacher gasped. Well, that's just wonderful, Tyrell. This is the first time I've ever heard you speak, he said as he marveled at him. Do you like astronomy? He smiled warmly and shook his head. Later that day, Tammy's phone rang. It was the call from the school. Hello, Miss Parker. Yeah? This is Mr. Gonzalez. I work alongside Mr. Brill in your son's special education class. I'm calling today because something remarkable happened a few hours ago. Your son made a true breakthrough. He spoke in class for the first time. Tammy paused. What'd he say? I don't exactly know. I wasn't teaching the class, but I know Mr. Brill was just thrilled. Well, that's great. Tammy said forcefully. He's made real progress this year. 
The severity of his symptoms continued to decrease, and now we can begin focusing on his speech. Tammy just sighed, fearing she'd lose control over Tyrell if he was to completely gain his mental faculties, something that she could never allow. Tyrell stepped inside their home after being dropped off by the bus. Tammy turned down the TV and looked over at him. So, you got something to tell me? He looked at her fearfully. Your teacher called today and said that you spoke in class. Is that true? He nodded hesitantly. How long have you been able to talk? He shrugged his shoulders. You don't know? Or you just don't want to tell me? What, are you mute again all of a sudden? The dysfunction between Tyrell and his mother was so deep, so etched into the very fabric of his being, that he didn't even know how to begin to open up and express himself to her. Well, if you're just gonna stand there and stare at me, my dinner's on the table and it ain't gonna make itself. And make sure you add milk and not water to the macaroni this time. He nodded obediently as he sat his backpack down. The next morning, Divinity made breakfast as Tyrell stood next to the kitchen table putting his books in his backpack. Tammy looked up at him as she waited at the table for her food. I pulled you out of that school this morning. What? No! Tyrell said, grimacing. Oh, so now you can speak. He looked over at Divinity. The two locked eyes and she shook her head inconspicuously, then quickly looked away. I can homeschool you, and I'm going to need you to be here and take care of me when Divinity leaves for college in the fall. The rest of the day, Tyrell moped around the house. When Divinity got home from work, she sat next to him on his bed. Listen, I don't like what Mom did either, but she got me. We've always had each other's back. But you're leaving. Not for another six months. I'll help you with your schoolwork every night after I get off, okay? But you gotta do me a favor, and you gotta be strong. This won't last forever, and one day you'll be able to leave just like me. I promise, Ty. Every evening, Divinity would quietly work with Tyrell in his room. They covered math, science, language arts, and social studies. She even began helping him with his speech. It started with basic exercises that focused on pronunciation. Soon, though, he was learning new phrases and how to structure his sentences. He tried to absorb as much as he could, knowing that their time together was fleeting. There were moments when he would get so frustrated that he would break down in tears, but his will to keep advancing was unwavering. Divinity had long since moved away to attend college, but her love and patience made a lasting impact on Tyrell. He now had his driver's license and was able to run errands for Tammy as well as drive her to and from her doctor's appointments. One day, while Tyrell was playing video games, there was a knock at the door. Standing outside with a suitcase sitting next to him was a thin, sketchy-looking man. Hey, man. It's your Uncle Sean, he said, scratching his neck. Tyrell stood there for a minute with a puzzled look on his face. Was my mom expecting you? Yeah, I talked to her last week. She said I could stay until I get back on my feet. Sean? Sean, is that you? Tammy yelled from her bedroom as her brother walked inside their house. Yeah! Come in here! Sean walked up to the doorway to her bedroom and sat his suitcase down. You can stay in Divinity's room. It's right around the corner. She lowered her voice. And listen, if you start using, don't bring that shit in here. You got that? Yeah, and about the needles you found last time when I was here. They weren't actually mine, they were a friend of mine's and... Tammy's eyes widened. I don't give a shit if they were the Easter bunnies. Just don't have it in here. Her brother got quiet and looked down at the floor. Okay, yeah, you got it. She had found a way to get paid by the government for taking in her brother. It had been her hustle for almost two decades now, and she was again able to find a way to abuse the system. After dinner that evening, Tammy loaded the dishwasher. Did you have to wash the food off the dishes first before you put them in there? Otherwise, it'll clog up the filter, Tyrell exclaimed. 
She stood over the sink, shaking a plate in her hand furiously. What's the point of having a dishwasher if you have to wash everything by hand before you put it in there? She threw the plate back into the sink. You should be the one doing this. You're the one living under my roof for free. Tyrell sighed. Just leave the rest and I'll get them. Despite Sean's promise, it wasn't long before he was up to his old ways. Tammy came into the kitchen and discovered a bottle of whiteout that had spilled onto the counter. She shook her head. Damn it, Sean. I know what you're using that whiteout for. And it sure as hell ain't for correcting paperwork. You better clean this shit up. Whiteout had been a longtime favorite of her brother since he was a kid. He'd hold the brush up to his nose and began frantically sniffing it, often leaving behind the ring around his nostrils. Then he'd get a cocaine-like rush that would sometimes lead to violence. He'd overturned tables and punched holes in the walls on more than one occasion. But the whiteout took a backseat to heroin once he was able to score Graham. He began using in their shed in the backyard. He would sleep most of the day, but come evening, you could see light shining through the cracks in the shed's double doors. And if you happened to be within earshot, you could hear noises, barbaric yelling and grunting. One night, Tyrell sat in his bedroom talking with his friend Dylan. So is your uncle cool? Dylan asked as he bounced the tennis ball off the wall. I don't see him much. He sleeps all day and gets high in the shed at night. Dylan peered through the blinds and saw the glow of light that peeked out ever so gently from behind the gaps in the shed's doors. Back when I was like six years old, he took me and my sister to the fair. He met up with some friends of his and got so high that he forgot he was supposed to be babysitting us. Luckily, one of the vendors called security and my mom picked us up. She was pissed. Dude, that's fucked up. I don't know who's a bigger piece of shit, him or her. Where's your dad? I haven't seen him since I was little. My sister thinks he's locked up again. The bitterness and resentment that Tyrell felt towards his mother continued to grow as his understanding of himself and the world around him became more clear. Then one evening, he got a call from his grandma. Hi, Ty. I just called because I was thinking about you. By the sound of her voice, he could tell she'd been drinking. I was looking at some pictures of you when you were a baby. She choked up. You've grown in such an amazing young man. Me and your grandpa are so proud of you. It still bothers me that you almost got taken away from your mom when you were born. Taken away? Tyrell responded. How did I almost get taken away when I was born? Because of the damn drugs that were in your system. Wait, what? What do you mean drugs in my system? She sighed. Oh, Ty, you have to forgive your grandma. I had some wine with dinner tonight, and I think I may have already said more than I should have. His grandma's words replayed in his head for the next couple of days as he tried to come to terms with what she revealed to him. He began to wonder if his mom's drug use could have contributed to his disability. He sat at the table trying to focus on his schoolwork when he suddenly dropped his pen. He turned his head and called out to Tammy, who sat on the couch watching TV. Mom? Yeah? Did you use drugs when you were pregnant with me? Tammy froze. Where did you hear that? He turned his head back around and picked up his pen. Nowhere. I don't know who's filling your head full of lies, but the only thing I did was try and be the best mom that I could to you and your sister, she said as she shoveled cherry cordials into her mouth. Now that he knew the truth, his mind began devising sadistic ways to get revenge. He had found himself daydreaming about it before, but not to this degree. He waited patiently, continuing his role as his mother's caregiver insulin, then breakfast and morning meds, lunch, then insulin again before dinner and evening meds. But this desire for vengeance burned inside him until one day when he began carrying out a plan that he devised. 
He took one of his mother's syringes and a bottle of insulin and slipped it into his pocket. He then made sure that his uncle was sleeping and walked back to the shed. On a table sitting next to a dirty cloth chair were several heroin needles. Tyrell carefully emptied out the heroin into a container. He refilled the empty syringe with insulin and a few drops of brown food coloring, which gave the solution a convincing amber tint. He then grabbed the other syringe out of his pocket and filled it with the heroin. That night, Tyrell watched as Sean walked back to the shed to get high. He tied a belt around his arm, then grabbed the needle that was filled with insulin and injected it into his vein. The belt fell to the ground, and he leaned back in his chair, anticipating the warm rush of euphoria. After a few minutes, though, he began to realize that something wasn't right. He tried to stand up, but he lost his balance and fell. He grabbed onto the table to pull himself up, but ended up tipping it over, causing the lamp that was providing light to go flying onto the floor. He began twitching and moaning, and soon his arms and legs started thrashing around. His jaws clenched shut, muffling his cries for help, though still allowing enough space for foam to slowly dribble from his crusty lips. The lamp lamplade tipped over and shined on him like a spotlight. The shadow it cast intensified the look of agony on his face as his body continued to seize from the massive dose of insulin. The next morning, Tammy noticed that the door to Sean's room was left open, and he wasn't sleeping as usual. You seen your uncle? She asked Tyrell, who was placing her meds out on the table. Nope, he said, smiling. What are you all chipper for? No reason. Tammy raised her eyebrow. She sat her reinforced walker next to the couch, then sat down, crashing onto the cushions. She grabbed an alcohol wipe and cleaned her stomach. Tyrell pretended to be filling a syringe with insulin, but when Tammy wasn't looking, he pulled the one filled with heroin out of his pocket. He walked over to her, hiding the barrel in the palm of his hand. She squinted, anticipating the jab as he quickly injected her. After a few moments, she got a puzzled look on her face. Something feels different. Almost like I can feel the medicine going through my body or something. Tyrell stayed quiet as he watched from the kitchen. I feel dizzy. She then began gagging and spit up on herself. She sat there for several hours in a daze. Saliva ran out of her mouth and down her chin as she slumped over, going in and out of consciousness. She finally dozed off, snoring thunderously. When she awoke, her hands were cuffed, and her leg was chained to the floor. What the... She said as she wiggled her extremities. Tyrell, where the fuck are you? And what the fuck's going on? Tyrell walked into the room smiling deviously. His mannerism, which was once docile and reserved, now seemed dark and sinister. Hi, Mom. <laughs> you know, it still amazes me that I can call you that. She had a look of shock on her face, a look that he had never seen before. He walked around her slowly. How's your cuffs? They're not hurting you, are they? He then notched them down tighter, cutting off her circulation. Owie! Why are you doing this? She cried out. I remember when you zip-tied me to my bed, and the cuffs were so tight that when Dad finally cut them off, my wrists were bloody. <laughs> I know the zip-ties were uncomfortable, but I only used them when I couldn't find the dog leash. I did it for your own safety. Shut up. Shut up, you sick bitch. Tyrell looked like he was unraveling as he paced back and forth in the living room, trying to decide what his next move would be. You can sit there and see what it feels like to be a prisoner. You can get a small taste of what me and Divinity felt like growing up in this fucking house. 
He finally sat down in the recliner and put his head down. So, what are you going to do? Tammy asked hesitantly. Tyrell looked up slowly. There's going to be some rules. I enrolled myself in school again. You'll get bathroom breaks before and after I get home. You'll get fed, but you're not going to like the food. And if you try to escape, there'll be consequences. Tammy tried to reason with them. <laughs> Listen, baby. If you just let me go, we can forget about all this. I know I wasn't perfect, but I'm your mother and I love you. Her eyes filled with tears. You wouldn't hurt your mom, would you? You were never a mother. You never earned that title. As far as I'm concerned, we've always just been strangers living in this house together. Tyrell said numbly. He then got up and went to his room. Tammy began looking around frantically for her phone, but it was missing. She tugged on her leg irons that were nailed to the floor, but there was no budging them. <sighs> Fuck, she said under her breath. Dinner came in the form of a mushy brown lump that Tyrell spooned into a bowl. It was a bland, unseasoned mix of milk, stewed tomatoes, oatmeal, beans, and margarine that was blended up and baked. He put it in front of Tammy, then uncuffed her hand so she could eat. What's this? Your dinner. It's all the food we had lying around the kitchen. Tammy sniffed it, then bravely took a bite. She got a nauseated look on her face and quickly spit it back out. <laughs> Tyrell... I can't even eat this. Well, you better figure out a way because that's your breakfast and dinner again for tomorrow. Tammy finally fell asleep on the couch a little after 10 o'clock that night. She would sleep for a while, then wake up startled from a noise she would hear. She couldn't tell for sure if it was the house creaking or the wind outside, or maybe Tyrell hiding just around the corner, playing a twisted game. The uncertainty kept her on edge throughout the night. The next morning, the sound of the microwave door slamming shut woke her up. Her hair was matted and her eyes were bloodshot. Tyrell served her another steaming bowl of the same foul mixture. She didn't want it, but she was getting lightheaded from not eating, so she forced a few bites down. Just so no one hears your screams in case you start yelling for help, I got a surprise for you. Tyrell set a large speaker on the coffee table. I know how much you love country, he said with an evil grin. Tammy loathed country music, and when Tyrell would put it on in the car, she'd get irritated and immediately change the station. Achy Breaky Heart by Billy Ray Cyrus started playing at full blast on repeat. He then threw his backpack over his shoulder and left for school. Tyrell! Tyrell! She hollered helplessly over the music. When Tyrell got home, Tammy had napkins stuffed in her ears. He stopped the music. She looked around the room, glossy-eyed. I need my blood pressure meds. I don't feel well. You'll get your meds with dinner. He uncuffed her, then led her to the bathroom as he watched from outside the door. He heated her up another portion of the slop that he had prepared the day before. He made sure to keep her medicated so that she could stay alive long enough to experience the suffering that he had planned to inflict on her. That evening, Tammy fell asleep early. When she woke up some time later, the lights were off and she could see the glow of a cigarette and the silhouette of someone sitting across from her. She blinked her eyes, still somewhere in the realm between reality and dream. Her eyes suddenly opened wide and she gasped in terror. <laughs> Tyrell! Tyrell, is that you? The lamp turned on. Boo! <laughs> Tyrell said as he chuckled to himself. I picked up smoking from some of the guys at school. He took a drag off his cigarette, then leaned forward in his chair, blowing the smoke in her face. He grinned and looked down at the floor thoughtfully. Is that why you pulled me out? So I wouldn't turn into one of the bad kids? Or was it really to take care of you? 
Or maybe something else? Maybe you were afraid I was learning too much and I'd find out the truth. Tammy shook her head nervously. Tyrell scowled. I don't even know why I bothered asking. Grandma already told me everything. He stood up and walked over to her, then slowly put his cigarette out on her arm. <laughs> shit! She exclaimed, flailing around on the couch. <laughs> Are you gonna fucking kill me? Because I can't take much more of this. Shut up. You don't get to decide that. I do, he said as he turned off the lamp and left the room. It was another sleepless night, and you could see the stress growing on Tammy's face. Tyrell threw down a plate of what looked like wet cat food in front of her. Is this fucking cat food? She asked, staring down at her plate. It's all there is left to eat. You know how to use my credit card. Run to the store and buy something, anything, just as long as it's people's food. Yeah, sure. Let me go buy you some steak and shrimp. Would you like a Coke to wash it down with, too? He asked sarcastically. At that moment, Tammy began to lose hope. She put her head down on her TV tray and sobbed. Tyrell put on achy breaky heart again and left for school. Tammy's stomach soon began to growl. She took a spoonful of the cat food and held it to her nose, then curiously tasted it. Shit, this ain't bad, she thought to herself. She then gobbled it down, licking the plate clean. That evening, Tyrell walked into the living room carrying another plate of cat food. As he sat it down, he happened to glance down at her feet. Looks like your toenail fungus is back. Tammy looked down and wiggled her toe. The nail had yellowed and was caked with layers of thick, bulbous growth. Tyrell left the room, then came back several moments later carrying a pair of needle-nose pliers. Tammy sat down her spoon. What are those for? I'm going to remove your nail. You can't be serious. Are you insane? Tyrell knelt down and grabbed her leg as she kicked and screamed. <laughs> no! Get away from me! He clamped down on her toenail with the pliers and with a few quick jerks, ripped it clean out of the bone. She wailed at the top of her lungs. <laughs> you son of a bitch bastard! She wiggled her toe around wildly as the blood poured out. Tyrell looked up at her and smiled savagely. The endless throbbing made it impossible to sleep that night. Tammy sat awake in the dark with her mind racing. She knew she had to escape somehow if she wanted to survive. She feared it was only a matter of time before Tyrell finally killed her. She finally dozed off sometime near dawn before being jolted back awake by the sound of Tyrell's footsteps through the living room. She looked haggard and began to smell from not bathing. Tyrell uncuffed her and she painfully limped through the bathroom. He drew the blinds and turned on the music before leaving for school. After he left, Tammy began trying desperately to break the leg irons again, but she didn't have the strength. Suddenly, she heard the doorbell ring. Help! Help! She shrieked, but her cries were drowned out by the music. On the front porch stood a group of Jehovah's Witnesses. Listen! One of the women blurted out. She started clapping her hands through the music. I love that song. Another man standing next to her smiled wholesomely. Well, I guess that was our blessing for the day. He pulled out a flyer from his coat pocket and sat it in their mailbox. The caption read, Need a way out? Ask for Jesus. Tammy could see their shadows through the blinds as they walked away. She frowned, then slammed her fist down onto her knees. I am not just going to sit here and die, she blurted out. She reached down with both hands and grabbed the chain on her leg irons. She began fiercely rocking her body back and forth, using her weight as momentum as she pulled as hard as she could. The floorboards lifted up at the seams with each pass. The nails that secured the chain soon began to weaken and bend. Finally, she heard a loud snap. The floor splintered and her leg irons flew into the air. 
She struggled to her feet, then grabbed her walker and hobbled towards the door as tears of relief streamed down her face. Help! I was taken prisoner in my own home! She screamed frantically as she drug her walker down the driveway. Some roofers who were working on the house next door quickly climbed down their ladder and rushed towards her. Call the police! She yelled. They began speaking in Spanish as they huddled around her. Police! She exclaimed. I don't know what you're saying. Speak English! Finally, one of the men handed her his phone and she called 911. Paramedics loaded Tammy into an ambulance as one of the detectives approached her. Hello, Miss Parker. I'm Detective Nick Baldwin. I'm sorry to hear what happened to you, ma'am, but I'm going to need to be placing you under arrest at this time. <laughs> placing me under arrest? For what? He pulled a set of cuffs from his holster and cuffed her hand to the stretcher. We'll speak more downtown after you get released from the hospital. Seriously? I finally escaped from being held captive in my own home, and now this? This is bullshit! She shouted. The next day, Tammy was taken to the police station for questioning. Well, Miss Parker, unfortunately, I have more bad news. We found the body of your brother in your shed. Looks like a possible drug overdose, but they still need to perform an autopsy, Detective Baldwin said. I just want to know what I'm being charged with, Tammy said, motioning with her hands. And we'll get to that. Well, did you get Tyrell? Yes, your son's in custody. I wouldn't put it past him to have some kind of involvement in that. I know he drugged me with something right before he chained me up. When the detective was done with his line of questioning, another man entered the room. I'm FBI agent Ivan Archuleta. The reason I'm here today is to inform you that you'll be in charge with medical fraud. Tammy's eyes got big. We were actually just about to move in right before this whole mess happened. Under what grounds? Tammy asked defiantly. I have all the transcripts right here. He threw down a stack of papers on the table. She looked down at the first page. One of the players you've been communicating with on your video game was an undercover agent. Does Tank Sinatra ring a bell? Suck. I knew he was too good to be true. We normally conduct sting operations to catch child sex predators, but occasionally other crimes are uncovered. He turned to Detective Baldwin. Cuff her up and book her. You'll be hearing from my attorney, Tammy exclaimed. Tammy sat in a visiting cubicle, wearing an orange jumpsuit. She stared at her father through a thick sheet of plexiglass as the two spoke on the phone. I can't stand to see you like this, her father said as he hung his head. I notice mom's not here. Is it because she's feeling guilty? Because she should be. She's the reason Tyrell freaked the fuck out. Look, I don't want to argue. I just want to try to figure out how to get you out of this place. Tammy's eyes filled with tears. I had a dream last night. Her father put his hand up against the plexiglass. What was it, Pumpkin? She sighed heavily. I dreamed that you brought me in a Carl's Jr. Double Stack Extra Mayo. The food here, it's terrible. I don't even think they use real beef. Her father took his hand down from the window. Tammy, you're facing up to 15 years in prison. And all you can think about is food right now? Tammy threw her arm in the air. Distracting myself with food is the only way I can stay sane in this place. Her father sighed. Just let me see how this meeting goes with your lawyer this week. Line up, ladies. It's strip out time. Deputy Ellis hollered down the hallway. Ellis was a butch woman with what looked like a rat's nest emanating from her scalp. She moved stiffly and militant-like. Tammy rolled into the strip-out room in her oversized wheelchair as Ellis glared down at her. Parker, I despise most of the human race, but I've already taken a special disliking to you. And don't think that just because you're in that thing, you're getting a free pass. I know you can stand up. 
After she finished, she exited through the side door, flipping off Ellis when she wasn't looking. Bitch, she grumbled to herself. Tammy hadn't been assigned a job yet, so most of her days were spent watching TV and playing cards in the day hall. She would often barter or gamble to obtain packs of Little Debbie's or Hostess cakes. She was finally assigned as an AM dishwasher in the kitchen. The sergeant met with her in his office as he went over his expectations. This isn't rocket science. Keep the dishes moving through the machine as they come through the tray slot. And keep up. Don't get distracted talking to your buddy about who was dancing with the stars last night. The last thing we need is dishes piling up back here. But as long as you show up, stay busy and don't steal, we're going to get along just fine. Working in the kitchen wasn't an enthusing job for her at first until she learned quickly of the perks. There was the food that was served on the main line and there was the food that the workers prepared for themselves. All sorts of creations such as the jailhouse burrito, parole day cheesecake, and her favorite, the fat bastard. One day after her shift, Tammy spoke with one of the girls that she befriended who worked on the serving line. Look up there in the office window, Tammy said. Tina looked around. Okay, what am I looking at? Star cakes. You ever had those before? Tina shook her head. They're my favorite. I haven't had one since I got locked up. She looked over at Tina and raised her eyebrow. You want to help me out with something? Oh, no. I ain't risking my job over no snack cake. Not just any snack cake. A star cake. She sighed. Listen, I'm starving in here. And what are you worried about? There's so much food stashed in his office that he won't even notice. Tina stared at Tammy ambivalently. I'll take the heat for it if he finds out. We're from the same hood, girl, remember? The next day, the two approached the kitchen sergeant in his office doorway. Tina knocked on the door. Hey, Sarge, may we enter? McGibbon waved them in. So, we was wondering if me and my homegirl could switch days off. Tina made sure to stay in front of the sergeant as she spoke to him. Tammy stayed behind her and looked around for any witnesses. What for? Well, mm. Tina struggled, caught off guard. Tammy popped up. My daughter wants to come visit me, and she happens to have some days off that Tina has. McKibben thought about it for a minute, then nodded. Well, that's a good reason, I guess. Let me take a look at the schedule, he said as he turned away. Tammy acted as if she was clearing her throat, then grabbed the box of star cakes and stuffed them under her shirt. McKibben scribbled some notes on his clipboard. That'll work. You can start next week. The two turned to leave. Parker, he exclaimed. Tammy immediately got a guilty look on her face. It sounds like you have a good relationship with your kids. As a father, I respect that. After they left, she pulled the cakes out from under her shirt and tore open the box, giving a couple to Tina. When she got back to her cell, she motioned to the control center to open her door. The slider slowly crept open, allowing her to enter. It then slowly closed behind her, making a loud thud as the cold metal snugged itself up against its frame. She wasted no time and quickly reached inside the box of cakes and pulled one out, tearing the plastic wrapper to shreds. She held it to her nose to get a whiff. It smells like home, she thought to herself. She began stuffing the cakes in her mouth while making grotesque chewing noises. She gasped for air while scarfing down cake after cake, almost like she was torn between two polar opposites that became one necessary evil. Soon, a thick sludge began to form in her esophagus, which backed up into her throat. She couldn't breathe. She couldn't scream. The box of star cakes fell out of her lap and onto the floor. She clutched her throat with both hands as her lips began turning a delicate shade of sapphire. During her next round, Ella stopped and peered inside the window of Tammy's cell. She tapped on the glass. Parker! She didn't see any movement. Parker! Move your fat ass! Control! Pop 11! Fuck! She said with growing distress in her voice. When the door opened, she ran inside. Tammy sat motionless in her wheelchair, with her head slumped to the side. 
Golden bits of cake were scattered on her jumpsuit. A stream of saliva still leaked from her mouth in what appeared to be the aftermath of a deadly fit of gluttony. A few days later, as the coroner examined Tammy's body, he noticed an unnatural bulge protruding from her neck. He poked it with his pen. I've heard of this happening before in rare cases. <sighs> the victim eats so quickly that the food doesn't have time to pass into the stomach and eventually gets lodged in the esophagus. Then, after so long, it begins to harden like cement. He turned to his colleague. They essentially eat themselves to death. He pulled a sheet over Tammy's head. Speaking of food, you want to grab some lunch? The other man asked. No, I'm so damned backed up with bodies that I'm just going to work through today. <laughs> Suit yourself. The coroner started on an autopsy of another body, then paused to go turn on some music. It's an all-ladies lunch hour, the DJ exclaimed. Hungry Like the Wolf began playing on the radio. He grinned and playfully moved his bloody scalpel to the beat of the music before returning to his work. And that was Son of a Bitch by author Brian Asbury. A good reminder that nothing is more terrifying than a mother's love. I stole that from the book cover, by the way. A little about the author. Brian Asbury was born and raised in Pueblo, Colorado. Growing up, he was heavily inspired by tales from the crypt and the Twilight Zone. And he looks to bring back good storytelling and horror. He's been a regular contributor for Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights, and his lineup on the channel so far includes The Chair in the Closet, White Coat Syndrome, Outskirts of Meeker Valley, The Last Level, and A Token of Gratitude. He's currently in the midst of a summer-long Barnes & Noble's book signing tour through Colorado for his newest release, A Windowless Room, Excursions into Horror. You can read his books by searching for Brian Asbury under books on Amazon.com or by typing in Brian Asbury on BarnesandNoble.com or if you happen to live in Colorado by simply stopping in your local Barnes & Noble and searching for his books on the shelf. Fans can connect with him on Facebook under Brian Asbury, writer. Brian would like to thank his lovely wife Amber who has been a huge source of help and inspiration in his writing and all his friends and family. You know who you are. Thanks, Brian. And hey, Brian, thanks for the kind words you said about me and plugging the podcast on the Fox News interview you did. I really appreciate that, friend. And do old Drew Blood a favor, would you? Subscribe to his podcast wherever you do your listening and leave him a five-star review and a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. He needs soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and he appreciates it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all the other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click Patrons in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at chillintalesfordarknights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to their entire audio archive, all ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all the latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with them each and every week. Oh, and you can find Drew Blood on Facebook and Instagram, and sometimes Twitter. The Drew Blood's Dark Tales podcast is accepting submissions, friend. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on the show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment, 10 bananas. Well, 
I'm afraid this is where we part ways. At least till next week. So grab a drink for the road, friend. I assure you, your office buddies are three sheets to the wind by now. The way I see it, you've got some catching up to do. And this week, I'd like to send out very special regards to Monk the Cat, my new friend and long-time listener of the show, apparently. <laughs> Thanks for listening every week, Monk. I love cats, and you are definitely a cool one. Oh, and hey, Miss Elizabeth. So may the wind be at your back, and may the road rise up to meet you. Just don't let the road rise up to meet your face. And for all you bootlickers still at the office, we appreciate the hard work you do. God knows you keep the country running. But as soon as you're done tonight, go fuck yourselves. <laughs> Good night, y'all. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.